Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Change Food Eats. I'm Diane Hatz. I'm your host for today, and I'm excited for our guest. Our guest is Bhavani Jaroff. Bhavani is a natural food chef, educator, farm to school coordinator, and radio host. She's the owner of I Eat Green, a multifaceted organization providing chef services, cooking classes, and educational demos for families, schools, businesses, and libraries. She has over 30 years experience cooking natural foods in restaurants, cafeterias, and for private events. Bonnie Jarhoff, so great to see you. How are you today? Great, thanks. So I have to ask, first off, you have a garden on your kitchen table. What are we looking at here? Well, I went out this morning. You know, it's always best before the heat gets really hot to harvest the vegetables in the morning. So I harvested some kale, some Swiss chard, some Napa cabbage, some green beans, some onions, a butternut squash, some jalapeno peppers, and of course my zinnias. Are you going to be able to cook all that food? Do you have a family? Yeah. Like, how does one not waste that food? It's a, it's a challenge. You know, I invite people over to come pick from my garden. Um, you know, I, one of the things, you know, I have a business called I Eat Green that I know we'll get to later, but always in years prior to this, I was constantly doing events. And so I would be using my vegetables for these events, but I didn't shrink my, my garden down this year. I just kept making, you know, doing the same amount that I always do. And so I have had a lot. Just for people, you know, anyone who might have a garden, because right now it's like the most productive, gardens are at the most productive um, right. in the Northeast. So for anybody who has extra vegetables, don't let it go to waste. Go to ampleharvest.org and you can Absolutely. find a food pantry. Yeah, yeah I think that's fantastic. Great organization. So what are you eating today? Well, I just made myself a salad with, you know, I have microgreens that I grow in the garden along with arugula oh God. and assorted lettuces and then carrots and cucumbers and peppers all from my garden. And then I also have a um, beet green pate, but I actually use beet greens and radish greens for this. And, you know, we all talk about food waste. And one of the things that we used to always waste were the tops of the radishes and the beets, the things we didn't know what to do with, even carrot tops. So what do you do with carrot tops? Well, the same thing that I do with the beet green tops and the radish greens, you can steam them um, and then blanch them again, putting them in an ice bath that you lock in the color so that it's bright green. And then um, I make a pate. I saute some onions and celery, some garlic. Um, I put it all into the Cuisinart with the beet greens that you really squeeze the water out and then walnuts and then a bunch of different spices, a lot of garlic. And you come out with this pate that is just so great. So am I asking too much? to ask you to share that recipe for the pate They're all with on us? my website. If you go to ieatgreen.com and then you click on recipes, I have all my recipes and every week on my radio show, I share a weekly recipe. I'm asking everyone this question that I'm interviewing. How can we create a food system where everyone can eat healthy food? We have to get rid of industrial agriculture. We have to stop subsidizing the industrial agriculture, meaning the commodity crops, the soybeans, the corn, stop subsidizing those and start subsidizing farmers that are transitioning to organic so that we can support farmers that are supporting the soil. Because about what, everything about organic really happens in the soil. And you need to build the soil up with nutrients to make it viable to grow our vegetables. Right now we're losing so much topsoil that there's not enough topsoil left to keep farming the way that we do, even the organic farmers. So we need to really um, pay more attention to the soil. We stop, have to stop putting in the um, industrial inputs, you know, the pesticides, the herbicides, the fertilizers that are all oil synthetic based and start um, using, you know, compost and um, manure from animals and really just change everything up. We need to have, stop having these mega monocrop farms and start having more um, permaculture and regenerative agriculture and full cycle farms. Organic food is more expensive than, than you know, commercial food. And it really shouldn't be that way. You know, one, one of the reasons it is that way is because the people growing the, um, growing industrial food system, they don't, they're not responsible for the cleaning up of their mess or for the healthcare outcomes that 
people have to take on. And so as a taxpayer, we pay to clean up the messes that they make, the, the pollution in the rivers, the, um, you know, the climate change that is coming upon us so quickly. Um, you know, industrial agriculture really adds to that tremendously. And so we really need to just change it all from the bottom up. People think of organic as a marketing ploy and as, you know, um, you know and that's a spin that, that the industrial food system has put on it to make people think that organic is really just, uh, you know, for the elite and more expensive and it's, you know, um, not good, you know, not something to support, but it's really so important. The new study that shows that if you eat organic, you can get rid of 70% of the pesticides in your body. I mean, people have so many pesticides and herbicides in our body. All these things, I mean, it's very hard to pinpoint and no one has the money to do all the testing that needs to happen, but it's very hard to pinpoint what exactly is causing all the autoimmune diseases, all the spikes in cancer, all the allergies that people have, the asthma, the obesity, diabetes, all these things that, you know, and then and young women not being able to get pregnant, you know, there's so many different things that are caused by the foods we eat and people don't give it that enough credit. So what do you think about, you mentioned organic, um, what do you think about organic versus regenerative? Like how do you, how do you define either or do you see them as the same you know so so what's your take on on regenerative and where we're going with it um interesting you just asked because actually just two days ago i participated or i sat in on a webinar um, for vegans and vegetarians about regenerative agriculture because how do they support that because regenerative agriculture you know needs right. animals right to right. to graze on the land to fertilize the land with their manure. And they're an, in, an integral part of the farm lifespan. What we, you know, and so I am supportive of that. However, I also am supportive of people really reducing the amount of meat they eat. And meat that is grass fed, you know, takes a lot more um, money to produce um, because the animal's living longer, you're not giving them junk food, you're not giving them GMO grain, they're, they're out there, so they're just around for a longer time. Um, and, and yet they are participating in um, the cycle of feeding the, the soil. And as a vegetarian, or actually I'm a vegan now, you know, I really support people who, if you're gonna eat meat, and I know there's a lot of people that you know, say I can't go vegetarian, and that's okay. But then make it make an effort to support the farmers that are doing it the right way. Everybody has to eat less. Right now, we eat right. You know, the our country just consumes so much meat, and that is completely not sustainable. And it takes you know twelve pounds of grain to net one pound of meat, and that's just not sustainable when we have a lot of people to feed. What's your take on? Uh, things like the Impossible Burger versus um, pasture-raised meat, especially being a vegan. Because I tell people I'd rather you eat a pasture-raised burger, even though it's more expensive than an Impossible Burger. Right, because it's real food. An Impossible Burger is made in the lab. You know, any it's food that's not made even, in the what? What's that? But I got to. I, I do have to say this. That's they have talking points to come back about. It's not a lab. It's whatever. But what I try to explain to people, it's processed. When you have any isolate or pea protein or soy protein isolate, it's processed. Once you strip a plant of its ingredients, it's processed. My thing with Impossible Burger, is, as opposed to Beyond Burger, Beyond Burger at least does not contain any genetically modified foods. And it's Impossible they're better quality burger. ingredients. I mean, they, and they are. They, they, I'm not even. I'm not saying everyone go out and eat, eat Beyond Meat, but if you're choosing between the two, the ingredients are more whole than Beyond Meat. Absolutely. Uh, and but, um, and I'm I'm with you also. If you're going to eat a burger, um, I you know I think a grass-fed meat burger is better. But I think also the where Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger um, is beneficial is actually just to show as an example to a meat eater who says I could never eat just salad. I mean, people think I'm a vegetarian. All I that I eat this every day, all day, and that's it. And 
that's so not the case. Everyone needs to eat real food. That's the bottom line. We need to eat right. real food. And right. um, you know, that's not what people are eating these days. Everyone's eating so much processed food. And so real food is what it's about. And um, let's talk about I eat green. Tell me about your company, what it is that you do, and all that kind of yeah. good stuff. Well, I, I eat green has transitioned over the years. I've had it for, you know, a number of years now. I am a community organizer. I create events for my local community, uh, farm to table events, tours, and <clears throat> I'll use my vegetables to cook. And a lot of times I'll cook. I do a film feast every year at a local independent cinema um, where I show lots of short films and I pair it with the food that is highlighted in the film. When I first started, I was doing a lot of private chefing, um, going into people's homes, cooking for their families. Also organize a lot of in my community events, feeding the homeless. I would partner with a, um, a food pantry called the River Fund, New York. They're actually the largest food pantry in the city now. Um, wow. They feed, they feed so many people. And so every Thanksgiving and Christmas, I have over a hundred people that sign up for shifts, 16 people at a time come into my home, families with kids, whatever, and we scrub potatoes and, and we cook turkeys. You know, I'm a vegetarian, but I know that this is what the people that are hungry out on the street want, they want their turkey, but I also will do tofu cutlets with mushroom gravy because there's a lot of Hindus that are on that line that are vegetarians and also half of us that are volunteering are vegetarians and we like to eat the food too. So other than the turkey, it's all vegetarian. We do stuffing, we do mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, green beans, lots of green beans. Um, and so I do a traditional Thanksgiving. We feed over a thousand people. We've been doing that for 25 years now. Uh, with COVID, you put on events, you're talking about all these events. What, what do you think is gonna happen now? Like where do things stand? I don't know. I don't even know how the schools are going back. Well, you know, we haven't talked about the school yet, but um, you know, I don't know when these events will return, you know, and if they will, mm. you know, I really don't know. Um, so, I'd say, you know, I eat green at this point, mostly what I'm doing is my weekly radio show where I interview people and I send out a weekly newsletter that has an, a section that's in the news where I'll highlight, you know, whatever's new in the food realm um, or environmental realm. I'm also an environmentalist. Um, and then I, and I'll share in the newsletter whom I'm interviewing. And then there's a take action part where I ask people to sign petitions for, um, you know, the national school lunch program or anti-fracking or, you know, getting pesticides out of our food or GMOs or whatever, whatever is needing support that week. I'll, I'll have a take action part. You know, it's a new normal and no yeah. one really knows how it's going to be. I don't even know if my school district is going back you know, it's going to be serving lunch. I mean, I'm still waiting. You still don't know? No. They, well, they say school's going to start September 14th, but they haven't said, you know, as of now, they're still not going to open the cafeteria. They're going to do bag lunches. Oh. Um, yeah, people are going to eat in their classroom. Kids aren't going to come in all at once. You know, there's going to be different shifts. Um, but I, I don't know yet. You just mentioned school. So you are a farm to school coordinator. What exactly is that? what do you do okay well the school district that i work in which is glen the city of glen cove um they have 3200 that, sorry that's long island that's on long island but it's its own city they have 3200 kids in the public school and they are over 60 percent qualified for free and reduced because of that they were able to apply and they were awarded a grant from new york state ag and market department of ag and markets as a farm to school, um, a farm to school grant. And what that does, it, it has an allotment for a farm to school coordinator. And my job is to make contacts and build relationships with local farmers where we can purchase local, fresh seasonal vegetables and bring it into the cafeteria and introduce it into, um, introduce it to the kids. This is not oh. what they're eating for their meal. I'm giving them a taste. So I, I will buy, you know, hundreds of pounds of whatever it is. I think I bought 600 pounds of butternut squash um, last fall. And, um, you know, and I made a butternut squash appetizer, one that I make that's just delicious. And then I went to all six different schools 
and I set up a nice, beautiful display kind of like this where, you know, you, it really looks appealing. And I would go around with a, a tray and I put it on a silver tray with doilies because I used to do catering. So, you know, I, I'm really into presentation, how it looks. Kids, you know, and so these kids who are not used to it would have me come around with my apron, serving them on a silver tray with a doily, a little dish of this butternut squash appetizer. Or um, the month that we closed in March, I was doing a kale and Napa cabbage salad um, with an Asian um, ginger dressing that was just delicious. And, and we were closed down, so I had so much of this kale and Napa cabbage salad left that we put it into the little plastic four ounce cups with a lid and everybody got it in their bag lunch. So that's what I'm thinking we're probably gonna move towards um, this fall that maybe I'll just be making different salad things that can, or you know, things that could go into the bag lunch. So you're the farm to school coordinator for a school. You bring in this farm fresh food, but you're just giving taste tests. It's not in the cafeteria food. Why not? That is so, it's infuriating actually. Yeah. Like I thought you were taking food and adding it as an ingredient to their lunches. That's the, that's the hope. This is supposed to inspire that. But to really get to that, there, you know, just like with our food system, why can't everyone eat organic? It's so, um, it's, they've been doing it wrong for so long that there's so many things that have to be undone to make it right. The National School Lunch Program was you know, set up, I mean, People think right after you know, World War II, but it really even started earlier than that. But um, the lunch program was subsidized by the government, meaning that the cheap food or the commodity food that they raise where there's a surplus, they give it to the schools, some free and some really cheap, and mostly it's meat and dairy stuff that they give, they don't give, you know, they will give some frozen vegetables or canned vegetables that can be a commodity food too, but it's all not the food that any of us are buying in our homes. I mean, even the, you know, the chicken, I'm sure the chicken that they're getting, you know, the chicken that they're getting is not hormone free, antibiotic free. I mean, it's regular chicken nugget, crap chicken. Right now, because of school, the money that schools have for their lunch program, they don't invest in their workers. You know, most of the um, lunch ladies, and even if you, even if the school doesn't have the lunch ladies and actually go to a food, goes to a food service company like an Aramark or a Sedeco, um, they, you know, it's all about make, they want to make money. And so they make sure that they keep all their employees on a part-time basis, you know, women have, three hour shifts, four hour shifts, no one's full time. They don't have to pay benefits. Um, they don't get insurance and they're paid pretty low, like a minimum wage. And so they are busy the whole time, just taking boxes out of the freezer, unpacking the chicken nuggets or the French fries or, or even like they also do breakfast, even an omelet, like a cheese omelet comes frozen bright yellow. I thought for sure it had yellowed food coloring, but it has tumor, you know, they use turmeric for the coloring or um, carotene or something like that. So there wasn't yellow food dye. I was impressed by that. Um, but, you know, everything's frozen. So all they do, they unpackage everything and they heat it up on um, cookie sheets in the oven. Um, I remember when I first started cooking for the homeless and I went into a school, I used the local school district kitchen before I was having people come into my own home and we couldn't cook the turkeys because the only kind of ovens they had were like the pizza ovens that were where you could get sheet pans in there but you couldn't get a turkey it was too high so we'd have to like squash the turkey down and flatten it in order to be able to get it into the oven so they yeah. don't have the ovens um, well, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of school cafeterias they took the oven the uh, kitchen equipment out and it's like microwaves and it's a lot, not a real a lot kitchen of them, anymore a lot of them are like that. Um, and, you know, so some schools have kitchens, some don't. In my school district, two of the elementary schools don't have kitchens. So the high school cooks for one elementary school, the middle school cooks for another, and they bring it to the schools in the thermal catering caddies that I used to use all the time when I had my catering business. They keep food hot, um, and they just have a line for the kids to come through and get their food. The idea is to move towards scratch cooking, which means scratch cooking means that you actually are 
cooking the food, not necessarily all from scratch. Like you can start with canned beans since beans take so long to cook. But then you're adding the sauteed peppers and the onions and the jalapenos and tomato sauce and whatever, you know, to the beans to make your chili so that you're not just defrosting so, chili. So, but that's an ideal. How is it actually being done? Like what, what are things that are being done? And I'm, and I'm not like, don't think I'm, I'm not criticizing in any way. It's just, I've heard this about school food and other things like industrial ag. Like we have these ideals, but do you know within the school food realm, people that are actually doing things? Like I know Ann Cooper, I think her organization, they're replacing the kitchen. Food, food School Institute she has. Um, mm -hmm. And she's actually in Boulder now working with the school district. And you have to get the school district behind you. It, you know, it takes money to make the shift happen. And they have right. to invest in the money. Over 10 years, you might end up, you know, saving money or breaking even. I mean, I don't really know how the finances pan out, but eventually scratch cooking is not necessarily more expensive. But at first you have to get the equipment, you have to put people on full-time salaries and pay them what they deserve. I mean, in my school district, the majority of the women are good cooks. They're from Italy. They still, they're, they're talking Italian. I feel like I'm in Italy when I'm there, you know, it's very slow food like. I mean, these women cook, but not at the school. At the school, they, you know, there's, they're taking, you know, ice cream scoop, four ounce ice cream scoops and putting fruit cocktail into a plastic cup with a lid. You know, even the ketchup, they're all plastic things. You know, I'm trying to move them towards, you know, the bulk pump, you know, and they're like, oh, the custodians will hate us with the pump, you know, it makes a bigger mess. It's like, no, the little plastic ketchup things end up on the floor too. You know, we need to move to, you know, bulk things. Um, you know, you can't get little organic milks in the little things. Way too expensive, but you can get, you know, like colleges have the big, um, the big plastic things of milk that you can dispense into a cup. But, you know, and especially now with COVID where everyone's paranoid about germs and getting sick, I mean, that's gonna be a really long time. So we can't get milk that's, you know, even hormone antibiotics free, you know, it's just, we don't have that power. Um, so, so it's really frustrating. It sounds like the state of school food overall is pretty poor. But with COVID and schools being shut, you know, many children, their main meal is gotten at school. So do you know how they're faring? Do you think, I mean, for some, maybe it's better that they're eating at home, but others it's worse because they're not eating at all. Like, what do you think the state of school food is in the light I think of COVID? It's really, it's really bad. I mean, you know, 60% of all school kids participate in the school lunch program, about 30 million kids a day, right, are being fed through the National School Lunch Program. That's a lot of kids being fed. When you take that out from under them, you know, I mean, the 40% that are not eating come from homes where the parents can package them a lunch. Right. But the kids that are participating, by and large, many of them come home to empty refrigerators. They don't have that option. And so it was really sad when, when our school districts shut down, we, we, had a, we started a food, an emergency food pantry like immediately because the families didn't have enough money. So many of them also lost their jobs. And um, so we had a food pantry, you know, I, I connected with, through Slow Food with Italians Feed America. And I was driving to New Jersey and getting boxes of pasta and tomato sauce and bringing it to our food pantry. And, um, and then Delta Airlines donated a whole bunch of stuff for the food pantry. I mean, I was just going and picking stuff up and, um, you know, it was really, it's really, sad because so many kids really depend on it. And that's why they even expanded the school lunch program to include breakfast. And they allow they, the kids to actually get breakfast at school now too, because how can a kid learn when their stomach's growling and they're hungry? They can't focus on any learning if you're right. hungry. Where you are in Long Island, like is the, the food, because we even here in New York, like anybody can have food delivered to them. They don't even have to go to a school to pick it up. Um, What's the state of the quality of food that people are getting? Do you know? When we went to the bagged lunches, they weren't really doing the cooked meals at first. You know, first they wanted to get through all the perishable food. So every from all the schools, all four oh. schools had refrigerators. They all brought it to the high school as the main commissary, and that's where they were doing the cooking. So first everybody was getting 
turkey sandwiches or ham sandwiches, or you know, they were going through the cold cuts. So that was that was what they did first. Then they started working on the frozen food. And so then they started packaging, you know, chicken cutlets and chicken nuggets and French fries and whatever they were doing with that. Um, and so they were using up what was in the freezer, which, you know, they needed to do. They needed to move that stuff out. You know, the quality of food, I mean, the frozen food, you know, you can choose, you know, this type of chicken nugget or that, that type of chicken nugget. There was one type of chicken nugget that looked completely like a stamp, perfect, didn't look like real food. And then there was another chicken nugget that looked a little bit more like a real piece of chicken. So we started getting that one. You know, so there's different varieties. You know, there's frozen French fries that have um, beef flavoring added to them. Um, and then there's French fries that don't have beef flavoring, you know, like the whole McDonald's thing. Like I, I couldn't believe when I saw beef flavoring, they called me the food police at uh, my kids' public schools because I was livid when I saw the French fries that they were serving, because again, my kids were vegetarian, had beef flavoring in it. Um, it would never even occur to me to check that, except- Nobody it did until- thing. Yeah, until it was like they were halal or kosher. They were uh, one or two people sued. McDonald's. McDonald's. That's they, in that's, India. It's the India. only way they got it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's the only way they got the flavoring out because I, I was a vegetarian too. And if I would road trip, sometimes McDonald's is like a place like that. It's the only place. And I get a salad and French fries. Right. Oh, well, right. guess I'm not vegetarian. Right. Exactly. So, you know, so the hidden food, the things that are inside the things are really gross. Do you know what we have to do? Like, like actual steps that need to be taken to get local fresh food into schools you know do we have to dismantle like like let's say i am like you know i have young kids i'm like i can't stand this i want to change the school food system and it is way more complex than people realize so so what are like some concrete steps that need to happen or that someone can do to try to start changing this um you need parents that care that's the first step. I think you need to mobilize parents. It can't just be one or two. You really need to mobilize parents to go to the school board or to um, join. Every school has to have a wellness policy now. And so in order to have a wellness policy, they usually have a nutrition and um, wellness committee. Join the committee. You know, having parents on board and, I mean, the teachers, the teachers were my biggest advocate in the in the school lunch program because they were so happy when they'd see me there once a, again it was once a month but they'd come back for many tastes of the samples because it was the best food in the school and um, you know so the kids that that did try it really loved it you know but so what do you think about school gardens do you think they're having any type of impact on school food is that a total separate thing it's not a total separate thing if you can have a school garden it's great. The problem is the school gardens are never going to be big enough to, to um, grow in the food for right. the cafeteria. I mean, it would be right. great if they did, but that would be a full-time, you need a full-time staff person to be running the garden in order to do that. And also, you know, here in New York, we don't have, tw um, you know, 12 months of growing possibility. Right. Um, but it is a great, great hands-on learning opportunity and when you know there's this saying you know if they grow it they'll eat it and it's so true i mean a kid who you know who gets to pick this green bean off of the plant themselves is much more likely to try it and it's great raw too i mean it's not only it doesn't have to be cooked and then you can do special projects with the food that you're bringing out one class can cook it up and make make a dish and um it's, you know, and all kids don't learn the same. So having opportunities for hands-on learning is so important. And you can um, do the whole STEM curriculum, the science, the math, you know, English. You can do art, all of it through a garden. I mean, you know, there's curriculums that are designed that are out there. You don't even have to reinvent the wheel. There's curriculums you can, some are free, some you have to purchase, but there's curriculums revolving around the garden. And so. I think a garden has a huge impact, and especially if you can start them in elementary school so that the kids are growing up with it. So what are you most hopeful about when it comes to school food? I'm most hopeful that, that more and more schools take that leap, 
making relationships with far local farmers. And I mean, when you buy local fresh vegetables, you're also helping the local economy. You know, you're making relationships with local farmers, you're supporting the farmers, you're supporting the workers that work at the farm. I mean, it's, you know, it's just, there's statistics that how, you know, buying locally, how that helps the um, local economy. So I'm most helpful that we really start going back to scratch cooking, um, that we start purchasing meat that's raised more humanely. I'd love to get rid of, you know, all this frozen food and have real cooking happen. You know, also when I, you know, I ran the cafeteria at um, the Waldorf School in Garden City. At the Waldorf School, it wasn't all organic, but it was, you know, any meat was hormone-free, antibiotic-free. Um, you know, all the dairy was organic that I was serving. And, um, and I presented it beautifully and, you know, all the a la carte. I was doing nori rolls and sushi and, you know, all this specialty stuff. It was really a wonderful um, opportunity, but it was amazing because we did have a salad bar. I think a salad bar should be in every school. Um, but when you have a good lunch program, the participation really goes up. Kids are feeling better. But what I was going to say is I felt like it was so important when you walk into the building that you smell deliciousness. You know, you don't want to walk into a cafeteria and smell ammonia or bleach, which is so often. I mean, they're, you know, cleaning it. And they want you to know that it's clean. But that's not what you want to smell. I mean, the kitchen cafeteria should be the, the same way as the kitchen is the heart of the family home. It should be the heart of the school. The cafeteria can become a community center. You know, that's what my passion with food is. It brings people together. You walk into a school and you smell something delicious. It's great. Anything else you'd like to share with us? Check out my website at iequin.com. My recipes are great. I love feedback. Also, I do have a Facebook at I eat underscore green. Um, it's a lowercase I, capital E, like iPhone, I eat. That was my thinking there. And, um, and I share a weekly recipe. And so that's really great. My radio show is every Thursday morning at 10 a.m. on the Progressive Radio Network, which is a website um, radio station. You can find it, prn.fm. Um, just put that into your cursor and you get it. And so it's live, but it's also recorded, so you can listen at any time. Thank you so much, Bhavani. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We will be back next week at 1230 with more please stay tuned follow like subscribe whatever one does or whatever platform you're watching on please join us